Um, I'm Dutch, love being in Utrecht. I used to be a police officer uh, just across the street, so this, I have a lot of different weird career choices in my life. <laughs> um, ask me about that later, uh, but I love being here, and again, appreciate you guys being here too. So, what I'm going to talk about today is Kubernetes and is Postgres, and it's the combination of Postgres and Kubernetes, but I first want to ask you one or two questions, because that kind of you know, the, the answer you're going to give me to my questions is going to um, make how nice I'm going to be about DBAs in general. <laughs> Who's a DBA? So I don't have to be nice about <laughs> DBAs. <laughs> There's a half DBA here in front. Okay, who, who does Kubernetes for a living? The rest. Cool. Okay. So that means that I'm going to have to explain a little bit about Postgres because otherwise this whole talk wouldn't make sense. There are a ton of databases, you can run a ton of databases on Kubernetes, so oh, Postgres is definitely not the only one, but um, it's the database your consumers, your customers, your users are going to ask for. And that's not something I made up, it's something that you, you guys know Stack Overflow, right? Everybody knows Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow does that yearly research paper where they talk about what the most popular technologies are that year and which platforms people want to use. Um, I'm not going to say this is this way every year, but this year, Postgres is the most popular database among developers. So it's a database your developers are going to ask for. And if you take a look at what developers want to use, even if they aren't, it's Postgres as well, by a pretty good margin. So it's not like this is just a random database that I'm talking about. It's the database you will probably run into. It's probably in your organization already, and it's probably the database your developers are going to want to use. Um, now I've been with EDB for about half a year, and just a little, little anecdote here, and which, which, I, which I think is really cool. Postgres, one of the reasons it's, it's, it's popular is because of its, of its extensibility. So Postgres is known as an RDBMS, Relational Database Management System, but Postgres is really, really extensible. Postgres has a concept of plugins or extensions, as they're called, which makes it possible to store all kinds of different data in Postgres, JSON, time series, vectors, whatever, you name it. So you can store a lot of different data types in Postgres, which is really cool. And the design of how this works goes back all the way into the beginning of when Postgres <coughs> was first thought of back at a university in the US in the 1980s. So this is a really old open source project. It's been around longer than Linux, if you want to look at it that way. And it's still innovating. Like there's a very popular um, Postgres extension, it's called PG Vector and it's used to store vector data. And if, you're, if, you're, if you've ever dabbled a little bit in AI, that's what a lot of the AI models use, to, for example, to give you recommendations in a store. But like with, you know, for example, the Wacom talk here at the next door, they have recommendations. It's bound to have something to do with some kind of vector database. So the Postgres can do that too. So why now? Why now? Why do we want to talk about Postgres and Kubernetes right now? Well, one of the reasons for that is, and I. Um, I get flown in to talk to, oh, flown in, <laughs> I train a lot, so it's training in, really, um, to talk to customers that are running on Kubernetes and have expressed a desire to run um, Postgres databases on Kubernetes. And one of the questions I always ask to any organization I talk to is, do you feel that over the last, what, decade, your organization has become less siloed? Silos have been connected, silos have been broken through, you know, just like the image over there, you get the different perspectives inside the big DevOps silo. A lot of these organizations say, yeah, yeah, we've actually been able to connect different parts of our organization together. We you now have operations, talking to developers, et cetera, et cetera. We have software-defined storage, software-defined networking. And then the second question is, so how does that relate to your databases? And it's like, yeah, that's a little bit less integrated at this point. For so whatever reason, the DBA database silo has never been really part of the DevOps movement until now. And that is a problem because if you talk to your developers and inside of your organization, I guarantee you that what they will say with regards to databases is that their prime problem right now is that I want the database now, not when the DB DBA has time for me next Wednesday. And that's a common thing. And if you disagree with anything I've said over the last slide and a half, please come talk to me afterwards because you would be the first. And I would be interested in understanding what you're doing in your organization. But the whole point of um, automation and self-service and building developer platforms is I want to enable my developers to be more productive. I want, to be able, I want them to be able to do things more on their own volition. When they need it, they need to be able to get it. 
That's difficult to do with traditional database systems, and I'll talk about that in a second. As I'm a DBA, and I understand there are no DBAs here, so you'll have to take my word for this. Um, DBAs are hard to scale, and that's not because DBAs are bad people. DBAs are extremely valuable to your organization, so be nice to them. But the problem is that databases, the amount of databases is growing. It's growing pretty hard. And it's very hard to scale your database team with the same speed. It's next to impossible. Try and hire a DBA. That's really, really difficult to do right now. So you will have to find a way to lower the load of your on your DBAs, automate things for them, and have them give them the opportunity and the time to focus on what is really valuable to your organization, which is what happens inside of the database instead of around it. So not building clusters, figuring out why your query is slow. That's way more valuable from the perspective of a DBA. And the third thing, why it might make sense to do more automation and run databases on Kubernetes would be, if I'm, if I'm a business owner, if I own an application, I don't want to plan downtime for my database upgrades. I, was, I, I spoke to an organization not too long ago who said, um, we have hundreds of databases, and they're of this and this and this version, and those versions were old. <laughs> I think they were programmed on clay tablets or something like that. They were really old. And the reason for that is not because it's difficult to upgrade <laughs> databases, because usually they're just in D Deb or an RPM or whatever. It, you need to plan downtime. You need to have people stand by. You need to have people do that generally at night because it's unknown how long that will take. It's difficult to do, and it will give you, if you don't succeed in the hour that you have for it, it will give you internal server errors for your application, which is something you don't want. If I can automate all that, that whole process, going from one version of Postgres <laughs> to another in just a matter of minutes, it doesn't really matter when I do it can do it at lunch. It just, I got a failover in, in, in a, a number of seconds and my database is running again. So there are all reasons to run Kubernetes, uh, Postgres on Kubernetes because it allows you to automate things really well without having to write that automation yourself. Now, I'm gonna circle back to a couple of models that I have encountered in the wild about how databases are delivered to developers. And it's generally either one of these two. It's either we have a very big database cluster in the corner. We will carve off a chunk for you. Here are the credentials. Have fun. And that works in terms of automation. This is pretty simple to do. You can write pretty simple automation to create a schema and, and create credentials and hand those credentials to someone else. The problem is this thing is shared, and I will have noisy neighbors. It will be impossible me for tune, to tune this from my workload. It gives me zero autonomy if I need to scale something out. And it gives me shared backups nine times out of 10. So that means that if I, have, if I need to restore something, I need to dig through a huge backup archive somewhere that includes tons of databases, not just my own. And because this database is shared and uh, he is using it for his app that requires database version 10, and he's using it for his app that requires version 11, and I want to run version 12 on there, this machine is not moving at all, never again because it's hard to do lifecycle management on a machine <coughs> like this. Do we all agree? Good, so the other model to deploy databases is by basically building kind of like mention clusters, I would call them. Um, this became possible after VMs became a normal thing, when, when Puppet, Terraform, Automation, Ansible, that came a thing. Um, you would build VMs and then install database software and create database clusters on VMs and hand people basically the keys to their own dedicated cluster, which is way better in terms of tuning and the ability for me to tune my cluster for my own workload and run my own backups. The problem with this is that this is layered automation and therefore complex, multidisciplinary, and hard and difficult and expensive to maintain. Also, if I get a new application, I start to develop a new application, and I need a database for that, and I have three t-shirt sizes that I can order a database in, like small, medium, large, which one I'm gonna order? The large one, so this <laughs> generally does not fit your use case very well. So this is expensive and suboptimal as well. So uh, basically it gives you either a piece of a pie that is way too busy and way too complicated and not really tailored for me, or it gives you a very labor intensive, possibly way too large pie that I can't eat in this whole. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes to the rescue, basically. But sidestep, I love how you can get these AI chatbots generating <laughs> images for you. <laughs> I love this. So we have Captain Kubernetes there, who is going to save us all. And that's because Kubernetes is a great platform to help you automate things. This is, Kubernetes on its own does not solve the problem of running databases in Kubernetes, but it helps, and it helps you build developer platforms. I mean, you're, I'm going to assume that a lot of you are in the process of building platforms for developers. 
It enables you to give self-service capabilities to your users because you will probably manage your applications in some kind of GitOps framework, and GitOps frameworks allows you to say, I need a database, if that would be possible in GitOps. Spoiler alert, it is. And it gives you autonomy. If I want to scale something on my own, I can, whether that's the amount of CPU cycles, the amount of database servers, the amount of storage I'm using, I can do that on my own, within my quota, obviously. So we need some of this. We definitely need some of this. We definitely need some Kubernetes <coughs> to make that automated deployment of my databases and scaling of my databases, et cetera, et cetera, a reality. But we're talking about a database. It's not a web server. If I blow away a web server, nobody cares. If I blow away the database, I'm probably out of a job. So if I'm going to build a database, a method to run a database on a Kubernetes cluster, I want that solution to be Kubernetes native as much as possible. So, and this is a little bit of homework if you're interested in Operator Hub or whatever, GitHub, you can probably find, I think, five, six, seven different operators for Postgres. And a lot of the currently available operators take the solution that used to be used for managing Postgres and virtual machines and cram that in, via and in containers which is probably not what you want. It makes the solution more complicated, and more heavyweight, and harder to manage and debug than it would be if it would be just Postgres and Kubernetes together. So I want it to be, as much as possible, Postgres and Kubernetes together. Um, I don't want to do any sacrifice. I don't want to sacrifice, sacrifice any of the availability that I have if I'm running on VMs. So I want to be at least able to go to four nines of uptime on Kubernetes. Is anybody here who's interested in more than four nines in terms of database uptime? One person. Two people. <laughs> Not a huge number. So four nines for most applications works. So I want to go to four nines. That helps. Um, I want this solution to be completely self-healing, but if I want to intervene manually, I want to be able to intervene manually. I want to be able to shut down parts of my cluster and investigate what is happening with my data files. So that's another important uh, requirement I have. I want, it to stew, um, I want this to be integrated in my monitoring and logging tool chain on Kubernetes. Now, logging is easy. Everybody knows how that works. You just take the pod logs and you scrape it and that's done. Monitoring is a little bit more complicated because mostly what you would have is your CPU cycles that your pod consumes. So I really want, it would be really cool if I can get my operator, my Postgres on Kubernetes solution, to give me metrics that are really about the database, like things like transactions per second. Again, spoiler alert, you can. And then finally, this needs to be safe. Data safety needs to be number one. <coughs> I don't want this, if this Kubernetes cluster burns down for whatever reason, which you know, every, every once in a while <laughs> probably happens, I want my data to be safe or as safe as possible in this context. So I want built-in backups. I want uh, replication to uh, replicas in my cluster. I want potentially replication to clusters outside of my Kubernetes cluster. Safe as possible. Can we do all that with Kubernetes? Kind of. You need to teach Kubernetes how to do this. So we'll get there. How can Kubernetes help? Well, if you look at what Kubernetes can do by default natively, you know, there are stateful sets, deployments, replica sets. I think I forget one. There's a fourth one. Come on, Kubernetes people. Yeah, there are more. But they all um, are mostly focused at running the same pod multiple times. Stateful sets are a little different because they um, connect stateful data to a pod. Daemon sets are a little different because they run on different nodes in your cluster. But all in all, it's generally the same pod that runs. For Postgres, that's not true. Postgres pods are not the same. So this is a very simple schema of a Postgres cluster over there. And you will see that you have one primary node and two replicas in this case. So at least, even in this very simple scenario, there are two different types of nodes in my cluster. There's the primary and there's the replica. If when the replica dies, if the primary dies, that's a problem because that's where my writes happen. So I want Kubernetes to be aware, or something to be aware, which of my pods has which role in order to take the right measures if one of them burns down. So that's something Kubernetes on its own cannot really do. So we need something like Cloud Native Postgres. So this is an open source project. Again, this is not, this is not a commercial talk by me. This is an open source project. You can go, go to GitHub slash Cloud Native PG or whatever, and you can download this. It's just completely open. <laughs> and um, it was written originally by a company called Second Quadrant, which was acquired by my current employer a couple of years ago. We open sourced this in 2022. Um, it has a huge community at this point around it, and it's really, really simple. <laughs> this is just 
Postgres and Kubernetes and obviously your operator process, but that's it. There's no fancy things that used to be used for VMs back in the, back in the day. It's just Postgres, Kubernetes, and an operator. Part of the CNCF, of it's under the CNCF umbrella, I should say. There's, so there's a lot of eyes, and a lot of people working on this, a lot of people using this. It's, um, I'm obviously <coughs> pretty enthusiastic about this. Delivers a new release every couple months, and we do that, or they do that, I should say. I'm not actively contributing to this, I admit. Um, they do that focused on real use cases. So this is not meant to be, oh, what kind of fancy feature are we going to do next release? This is really, what is it that our users need in order to adopt this technology? So one of the things the project did in the last release, for example, is to make it possible to do backups on persistent volume snapshots. Now, you will say, you know, what do you care? That makes it possible to use this for databases that are several terabytes in size and still restore them within minutes. And that's impressive because that's even hard to do on normal VMs. So that's really useful. And it's, um, it's, it's really something that you could definitely run production workloads on. And you can meet a 99.9% .9 SLA. So I would say, again, this is production ready stuff and um, go give it a try. I have a QR link later, QR code, so you can uh, get a direct link to the GitHub repository and, and take a browse, run some mini cube on your laptop, give it a spin. So the cloud native Postgres operator, it gives you a couple of CRDs, like operators do, that allow you to define a cluster, and then there are three more, one for backups, one for scheduled backups, and one for connection poolers. Now, you're not DBAs, so I'm gonna not talk about connection poolers, but the cool thing is, within one YAML file, you can describe a cluster, and that's, that can be as simple as 12 lines of YAML. You get a highly available, production-ready Postgres cluster that has um, automated failover, it has access management to the write nodes for read writes to the master, read only to the uh, replicas. A um, <coughs> little bit more YAML, like 10 lines more, it gives you automated backups, gives you point in time recovery to basically any point in time since the creation of that cluster. And it's all very simple to set up. So let me just show you, you we're technical people. Let's look at some YAML. Oh, YAML's later, sorry, <laughs> YAML's later. Um, I just wanted to, so I, I mentioned two things here that I think are probably interesting from the perspective of Kubernetes people that I want to talk about real quick as well. I talk about access management. How do I get to the right part of my cluster for the right type of query? I want to talk about backups real quick because those are really important for that data safety I talked about earlier. So if you look at your, your s very standard cluster, it doesn't do anything spectacular here. I have three replicas, one primary, so four <coughs> nodes in total. And what the operator will do for any cluster you create is we'll create three services. It will give you a read-write service that you connect to to write stuff to your database. It will give you a read-only service that connects to any of the three replicas and load balance over those three in order to load balance the read queries that you give to your database. And then there's an R service that basically load balances over R04 in case you don't have many writes and you just want to use all four nodes in your cluster. You don't have to do anything for this. You get instant built in the capability to do a little bit of load balancing without having to set up anything fancy or anything spectacular. It's just standard feature with the operator. The other cool thing I just wanted to point out real quick is, is the continuous backup thing. Um, who's, who is intimately familiar with Postgres? I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> like, like 10 people, okay. so. When you write something to a Postgres database, it is not immediately written to the database itself. Any transaction that is incoming will land in something called a write-ahead log file first. That write-ahead log file is basically a binary log file that you can use to restore your database to a certain point in time if you replay those over a base backup. And those are really, really valuable if you want to do a restore to a certain point in time. Because if you have a base backup and a bunch of wall files, you can pick any point in time, just take the base backup, replay the wall files up to that moment where you want to go to, and you got your point in time recovery. What we do, what we can do, it's not mandatory, it's optional, but you can configure your cluster in such a way that from the replica that is most in sync with your primary, all of these wall files will be written to an S3 bucket. And at S3 bucket, you can either create another cluster from that is completely up to date with the current one that we're looking at, or you can use it to restore this cluster to a certain point in time with. So you have always, you have full point in time recovery to any point since the beginning of this cluster, or whenever I created my first base backup, 
And um, I can restore this as a developer by just adding a little YAML to my cluster definition. So I don't have to go to my DBA and tell him, look, I want to have the restore of last Friday because something went wrong. I can just do it myself. So the operator will give me deployment of a cluster, configuration of a cluster. So Postgres is a postgresql.conf configuration file, which basically defines things like the amount of memory that can be used per query and things like that. Um, you can manage that thing with the operator just as any other bit of the configuration of the cluster as well. If I want another node, I'll show a little bit of YAML in a second, I'll change one digit from three to four, I will get another replica. Cluster burns down, primary goes down, the operator will take care of to create a new primary for me. If one of the replicas burns down, we'll create another replica, we don't care. Well, obviously we care because you have a little bit of a hiccup, but it's not much. Built-in load balancing over the surface, you get backup and recovery, we talked about that. Monitoring is actually really cool. So we deploy a tiny bit of custom SQL that the um, operator can use to, to basically <coughs> provision endpoints for Prometheus that gives you real in-database statistics, like transactions per second, which you can then plot in a Grafana dashboard. Um, we can fence one of the database nodes. So if you see a weird thing happening on one of the replicas, you can fence that one, which means we'll bring down the database process, but we'll keep the pod running so you can log into the pod and figure out what the hell is going on there. And you can hibernate a whole cluster, which means we bring the whole cluster down, <coughs> keep the persistent volumes in place. If you do batch proce processing at night, you might want to do this during the daytime, just bring the whole cluster down, hibernate the whole cluster, processes go down, and then at night, you rehydrate the cluster, cluster will continue running, and you have your data ready and waiting for you. And this gives you, as a just subset of what we can do with the operator, uh, this gives you as a developer, or as a DBA, or as a business person, a lot of freedom to do things. Because you can, you can do all of this from a GitOps repository, you can do all of this from a CI, CD pipeline, whatever. So in terms of complexity, this is how you define a simple cluster. And this even has a couple of lines in there that are not strictly necessary, so we could go down to eight. <laughs> this obviously doesn't do backups and that kind of stuff because that would add another, as I said, another 10 lines of, of YAML here. But it's still, it's pretty simple, right? This is not complicated. Anybody can do this. Anybody can build a cluster of Postgres for this. You don't need a, a Postgres degree. So this is a three node cluster. It means one primary, two replicas, right? Change that number to four. I will have another replica in two minutes. So I can scale out my read capacity pretty easily. Scale it back to three, we'll just delete it um, instantly. This will deploy Postgres 15.2. It's fairly recent, but 15.4 is actually the most recent 15 version. So I changed that to 15.4, and then the operator will update my replicas, because those aren't immediately crucial, one by one. And when the replicas are done updating, what will happen is we do a switch over of the primary role to the best replica at that point, and then update the primary. This will happen in minutes. It's completely automated, but just changing a single digit. This takes away so much of the pain of doing lifecycle management on databases. Um, and even, um, I was talking to an organization not too long ago, and they said, yeah, we need to go from Postgres 13 to 14, and that also means that we need to go from RHEL 7 to 8. So this is a huge problem, because we need to create more VMs and you know, do network segmentation, query question. Really complicated. If this would have been 14, it's a major upgrade, we can help do major upgrades with this too. It's not as automated yet, I have to be honest about that, it's not as automated yet as just going 14.9 and change it to 15.0 and you're done. A little, um, little bit more involved right now, but it's something the project is working on, and eventually you'll be able to do the same thing with major upgrades as well. It's not too far away. Want to change the storage to 10 gigs? Go right ahead, as long as your storage class supports that, you can just go to 10 gigs. Just going to resize in place. So a lot of the work he would have to do manually to make this all happen, it's all automated. Do a backup, seven lines of YAML. Gives you a backup of the simple cluster in uh, like a couple minutes. What if you want to do this every night? Do I need to write a cron job that does this or a job in Kubernetes or something like that? Well, no. Let's write a scheduled backup resource. This will do it every night, midnight, create a backup of your simple cluster. Over and done with. The wall archiving, like writing those wall files to the S3 bucket, that will happen no matter whether I create backups or not. That will just continue running. So this is 
from my point of view, this is pretty powerful stuff. I really like this. So from my perspective, Cloud Native, Postgres, and Kubernetes together, that's database self-service done right. This actually gives you the right size of the cluster you're looking for with the right parameters. Because you can define them yourself, after all. You can change those parameters after, um, after you've deployed it fairly easily, so you don't need anybody for that either. And it gives the developer that wants a database today, they can get a database today. If you're looking for autonomy to change the configuration of your database, you can do that yourself as a developer. As a DBA, I don't have to build clusters anymore. I get to involve myself into why a certain query is not performing or why there is a certain bottleneck in a certain cluster, which is, again, way more valuable of my time than just creating clusters. If I'm a business owner, I get a self-healing Postgres solution. No problems there anymore. I don't have to get involved in, you know, what, what kind of SLAs do I have? What kinds of uptime requirements? Do we, can we patch this at night? Sure, a couple of minutes. <coughs> and as a bonus, I can now manage and create and change my database as a part of a GitOps workflow. I can have my, data, my DBAs involved in that. If, if, if I want to have a DBA check um, whether what I'm doing with my database configuration, is, database configuration is in order, I can actually do that pretty easily by just involving them in the, in the, in the review process in my GitOps workflow. If I want to create a database as part of my CI CD pipeline in Tecton or whatever, and create a new cluster and then restore into that cluster a certain production backup from a week ago, we can do that. So I can do my actual tests with actual data without having to do all kinds of complicated requests and um, things I need to ask my DBA or my, my, my database people, my VM people, whatever. I can do this myself in GitOps, CI, CD. So I like that, but it also requires people that are DBAs to change the way they work slightly because this is by no means, again, DBA is very valuable people, very valuable resources, scarce resources in your organization. Um, but for them, running on database in Kubernetes does have impact because they're not running on VMs anymore, so it's obviously different from what you're used to. So things will change. There will be d things you do differently on Kubernetes than you would do on VMs. But the good news is, though, change is always there. I've been in IT for 25 years. I think m some people here will be in IT have been in IT for way longer than that, and there's only one constant in IT, and that's change. There's constant change in IT. When I started, there were still people doing things on AIX. I don't think I, I think I know one organization in in the Netherlands that still runs AIX. Uh, things change. That's not a big deal. The, the problem is is how you handle the change. And um, again, as I said, database numbers are going to grow. DBA numbers, probably not so much, or at least not in the same speed. So if you can automate away some of that work that is automatable, like creating database clusters, you can actually focus your time on things that are actually very, very valuable. And do that, automate things, have your DBA become part of that, that's magic, because your DBA is now an even more valuable resource. <coughs> 